Well, hello, I'm here with Caitlin to talk about old Biden, but first she's got cameras on the road. Yeah, so this is something new. Uh, we all knew that AI was coming to various parts of our lives, and I'm not quite sure what to think about this. Let me throw this up. So there's this article on The Insider talking about AI cameras being set up on highways. And the idea is that the AI software is going to constantly monitor drivers and check to see if they have any trash that they are throwing out on the road. And if they do throw trash on the road, they will then be automatically fined. And I was always under the persuasion that cameras that aren't actively monitored in public spaces are good for safety. You know, if a crime happens, it's nice to have the video there that you can go back to and reference. Uh, the thing where it gets dicey is that when it's actively monitored uh, and AI has the potential to throw, you know, cameras on every overhang, every block, you know, and have it monitored 24 seven by AI for infractions. And I am sure that States like China, North Korea are very much interested in this. Uh, any dictatorship would be very happy to have this this kind of tooling and absolute monitoring 24-7. Um, so I'm not quite sure how I feel about it, even in this limited sense of having AI just look for trash. Uh, but it's coming. Um, and this is something that we're going to have to deal with on a you know political and social level. Um, and... Yeah, there's not much much more to say about it than that. It'll be installed. Let's see. The AI, it says that the AI powered cameras will be installed in British uh, laybys in the coming weeks. Um, oh, so this is actually in uh, Europe, I suppose, in the UK. So, Big but Brother is, is watching. It's coming. Yep, Big Brother is definitely coming. Yeah, I, I first I was thinking this is a good idea, but then you had to ruin it. <laughs> yeah i mean like i said I'm, I'm not opposed to cameras like i always thought like the ring doorbell system was great because mm -hmm. then if a, like i said if a crime happens neighbors can come forward but they keep the um you know ring doorbell camera footage you know to themselves and not to the government uh so i'm not opposed to cameras but when you have like ai systems that can monitor for like infractions 24 7 and any kind of crime it's it becomes a bit of a you you have the potential to use AI to create a police state. So so I guess like putting on a drone and adding a machine gun to it would be right out. Yeah, some people might be opposed to that. Yeah, yeah, but it would create such order. It would create order, and it would be awesome. And technologically, it would be very fascinating to build. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but some people might complain for some reason. Well, you know how to deal with the people who complain now. Well, yeah, now you have the drones to deal with the people that complain. Perfect. That's right. Perfect system. <laughs> Wrong thinking is punished. Yes. Well, anyway, so um, Biden gave an interview on MSNBC at night with Stephanie Rule, and he it was only 10 minutes long. He answered about five questions, and I was sort of horrified. His answers were terrible. He seemed to forget what he was saying, interrupt himself, drift off the point, say things that were utterly false. Like they asked him, what about your son? And he said, oh, my son has done nothing wrong, Hunter Biden. And I think that's an outrageous thing to say. I mean, the evidence is extremely clear that he did a bunch of very wrong things. And um, so I was thinking, man, this is uh, really not good. Ah, and but and then they had a poll. Aha. Uh -huh. uh, the AstroCat is doing pretty well. Anyway, they had a poll that said Trump is going to beat Biden by a lot, 49% to 42%. And remember, he, uh, Republicans have a huge advantage, like 3% or so from the uh, Electoral College. So they also said that 18% of voters who believe Trump should be held criminally accountable for overthrowing the 2020 election will still vote for him anyway. So anyway, I'm uh, the, uh, I think it's the Washington Post- yeah, the Washington Post put up an editorial saying Biden needs to do press, uh, real press meetings where he lets people ask questions and answer them. He hasn't done a single one this year and he avoids it. And it's, when he does, he drops his notes and you can see what he's doing. And he's got crib notes to tell him what to say. 
it really seems like Biden is not got it together enough to deserve to be president. And I see the Democrats keep doing this. They did it with Ruth Bader Ginsburg. They just let her go on when she was far too old and obviously should have retired. They're doing it with Dianne Feinstein. Just let her go on when they know she should retire. And they're doing it with Biden. They're so nice. They can't tell somebody you're too old to admit you're too old. And, you know, we might end up with more Trump as a result. I mean, like most Democrats, I'll vote for Biden anyway, because I can't vote for Trump. But I really think they need to run somebody younger. And I think they need to admit this. This is their flaw. The Republicans have this hero worship thing where they follow Trump no matter what he does. And the Democrats have this niceness where they will not admit when one of their people has gotten too old. How old is Trump anyway? He's uh, 76. But he's much more energetic than Biden. I mean, he gives these rallies. He gives his speeches. He he does not seem to have slowed down the way Biden has. He It's all garbage, but he spews it out with energy. <laughs> anyway, um, we're going to see. Both sides seem to have decided they're not going to bother with primaries. They're just going to go with the front runner. But uh, I think it's a mistake on both sides. And so do most Americans. Very few Americans want this. They want both Trump and Biden to just knock it off and let's have some new people. Anyway, so you got Microsoft doing bad things. Yeah, imagine that, Microsoft doing bad things with their operating system. Who would have thought? Yeah. Uh, so according to Tech Radar, Microsoft is looking into putting ads not only in the start menu, because we talked about that before, but also in the settings app, which like, just no, please don't, don't, Microsoft, just stop. stop. The one I love a few years ago was they said they should put it on the blue screen of death. Put ads on there. That would be great. That okay. That that would take. That would be pretty cool. But <laughs> um, not in the settings app. That's that's ridiculous. So uh, there is there. So whenever Microsoft comes out with new versions of Windows 11 or any version of Windows, there's always like a developer preview where they're testing out new features and new ideas. And the latest version of Windows 11 preview uh, has, or the test in the chess channel has code for putting ads in the settings app. Uh, so we don't know if this is absolutely going to happen, but Microsoft is testing this out. Well, you Microsoft. know what they could do? They could just have it pop up ads randomly all the time you're working. They'd yeah, be they could, money that way. They could. They already put ads in Microsoft Office, which I was like, this is fantastic. That's exactly what I need <laughs> when I'm working is ads, you know, within my productivity software telling me I need to buy stuff. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my. Astrocat is enjoying the, the fake mice on the screen. And amazingly, the screen survives. I don't know how this is. So the I I have a mon I have these cheap monitors that I actually got for free. So if she destroys them, that's fine. So I thought we'll do a test. She really likes going after these mice. So I'll let her use these screens that I got for free to try to catch the fake mice. The screens have not been scratched at all. Hmm. Not one bit. And she, I don't cut her claws as much as I should. She, I mean, she tatters me up completely. Mm -hmm. I'm still healing from when I first got her. And, it, and my gosh darn legs are just torn to pieces. But the LCD monitors with the flimsy plastic in front, oh no, they're just fine. So, I'll tell. <laughs> so you need to toughen up and be like a monitor. Yes. Like an LCD monitor, no less. Yeah. Well, um, there, I got some more articles about AI. So companies are now offering over $300,000 to hire chat GPT experts called prompt engineers, which is the word. We just learned how to give the right questions in chat GPT and their training course in that. I'm planning to take it and see how it is. And um, But then the, the attack is prompt injection, where you put in carefully crafted statements to trick it into doing what it's not supposed to do. And um, there's going to be a DEF CON AI Village is going to have a all the large language models there and a social engineering sort of contest where people try to trick them into doing the bad things, which is probably a very good thing. And they say it opens up a whole new field of hacking to people who are not technical because it's really not technical at all. It's social engineering. It's phrasing things in a way that will trick it into doing the wrong thing. And this one really surprised me. There's a leaked document from Google that says that um, originally the proprietary Machine learning models had a big advantage, but uh, 
This technique leaked out called low rank adaptation, which greatly cuts down the effort and resources required to train a model. And that means the open source models are expected to do better than the proprietary models, which I don't really understand how that can be possible. But their Google's prediction is that their proprietary models will be left behind by the free open source models in machine learning. And that would certainly be handy for us if it's true, but hard for you to believe that the companies with the huge resources can't find something to do to make their product superior to the free product, but they think it's not going to happen that way. Yeah, and at which point, I don't even think you need prompt engineers if you have full open source control over the machine learning. You can just take away all the safeguards yourself. Well, on the one you run, yeah. And of yeah. course, and, and but I mean, the original thought I had is you had to use the other one because it needed tons of resources and you couldn't afford to pay for that. So you'd use something like ChatGPT and then you'd want to overcome their, their security features. But um, if it, companies run their own on their own hardware, then they can adjust it. And then, of course, you'd still have an incentive to hack them to uh, within the company, just like you hack the internal company servers. So the security remains important. But um, it's very interesting to see where this goes. Anyway, I guess I need to get that uh, that course in uh, prompt engineering and add it to my classes if it actually makes any sense, which apparently it does. Anyway, um, so apparently we have to give up phones, huh? Yeah, well, at least not not for adults. Uh, it turns out that smartphone addiction is a real thing, uh, and studies have shown that the same neural pathways and the same neural chemicals get released when you're addicted to your phone when you are also addicted to like a narcotic uh which you know is is fine if you're an adult and you can you can control yourself and you realize hey i'm getting addicted i'm going to put this down i'm going to go touch grass for a while that's fine uh the problem arises when you have kids involved uh kids unfortunately don't have that self control and self-awareness to realize that they're being addicted. Uh, and so there's this article on the Times of India that is uh, unfortunately uh, a little locked, um, but it's also mirrored on, on other sites. And it's called uh, Why We Must Break Our Children's Addiction to Phones. Uh, and this is by Chetan Bhagat. And like I said, it turns out that the neurochemistry involved in using your smartphone for long periods of time, getting addict, addicted to that, is very similar to drug addiction. So, and we're seeing this more and more. Like you go out to dinner and you see parents giving their kids iPhones and iPads and they they play on them all the time. Now, I'm not one of those people that were like, you know, oh, if we if our kids play violent video games, you know, they're going to turn into monsters uh, or anything like that. I mean, th that's not the case. You know, our children are not going to be playing video games and becoming violent. What happens is that they, if they spend too much time on smartphones and iPads, what happens is that their, their dopamine receptors and the do dopamine releasers essentially go into overdrive. Uh, and then they start needing the iPad, you know, not to feel crummy. It, it doesn't make them feel good anymore. It makes them not feel crummy. Uh, and that's where the problem lies. And if you talk to like smokers and other people addicted to substances, the reason they take it so often isn't because they get that high anymore. It's because if they stop, they just feel terrible. And that's what's really going on with, this, with the smartphones and the tablets for kids. And like I said, they don't have the the brain structures developed yet to be able to tell themselves, hey, I you know, need to take a break from this. I need to reset. I need to go away, do something else for a while. They um, they get completely addicted. And, and so this is a problem that we're going to have to deal with. Like how much screen time do we want to give our kids? And the thing is, is you don't necessarily want to give them zero screen time uh, because there are kids out there that do find tech interesting and you want to encourage that, but you also, you know, need to stave off any sort of screen addiction that they might get. This is very believable to me. I've read a lot of articles that say things like uh, kid, many kids are missing a lot of sleep because they stay up late at night on social media. And many young girls spend an enormous amount of time taking selfies and just a lot of clues that the kids are probably doing this way too much. Yeah, yeah, that's that that's the problem. Uh, and when I'm talking about kids, I'm not talking about teenagers on social media. 
I'm talking about very young children, um, you know, five-year-olds and six-year-olds, you know, kindergarten, preschool, first grade, second grade, third grade. Those kids are on tablets and phones a lot. And like I said, I don't think there's necessarily anything wrong with children, you know, using them. It's using using them to excess, which mm. becomes a, which studies show do become does become an issue. So, yeah, well, it's it's good to have uh, serious studies about it. Yep. And anyway, uh, another article came out with yet another reason why plastic recycling is nonsense. It's been known to be completely fake for a while. Only five percent of plastic is recycled in the United States, um, and the most of the marks that say plastic is recycling does not mean it's recyclable. They want in a court, they're not in court the ability to put that mark on bottles, even though it's not recyclable. Uh, so it's completely fake. And now it turns out that even what little recycling is done probably does more harm than good because you release a ton of microplastics into the water supply while cleaning the plastics and um, you produce low quality stuff that's not really much worth producing. So uh, we really need to cut down the amount of plastic we use in the first place, rather than pretending that we can recycle it when we can't. And uh, so that's a message we've heard before. But this latest test showing that you're actually polluting the place by recycling plastic is yet another nail in the coffin of that nonsense. So I think that's it for today. I have another one of these on Friday. <laughs>